throughout the entire six uh, Sundays of Lent. So please let that let that gospel reading become a part of your Lent, part of your experience. Study it, learn it, learn the parts that strike you at different times, and I have that become a part of your heart and a part of your learning of these six weeks of Lent. Uh, those last few verses of that uh, scripture reading, 5 through 11, those actually aren't Paul's original words, but those are taken from a hymn that was sung by the early Christians at the very beginning of the church. This was their lifeline that they hung on to, even as they were being martyred, even as the Roman soldiers were persecuting them, they hung on to the witness of Jesus Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but rather humbled himself in order to be raised. That is the example that we strive for as Christians, and that is the promise that we hold on to even as we are humbled and challenged in our own lives. So along that vein, for these next six weeks, we are talking about sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, what it means in our lives, and sort of redeeming this term of sacrifice uh, that had some, in some cases become an antiquated notion, in some cases has been abused, uh, the rights of human power, for the power of the oppressor over the oppressed, and instead redeeming this term of sacrifice, looking at it in terms of what Jesus did, and looking at it in terms of our own lives, and the everyday sacrifices that we make as followers of Jesus and how those sacrifices are redeemed. Remember that sacrifice is that Jesus emptied himself so that Jesus Christ is Lord. And even in our own lives, it's, it seems as we may be making sacrifices and suffering for our faith, waking up early, coming to church for our faith, that we in that same way are being redeemed. And so for the next five weeks, we're going to look at different types of sacrifices that we are called to make as Christians and the way that those sacrifices are redeemed by Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross. The important part to remember about sacrifice is that it implies the existence of the other. Sacrifice is not something that we do to raise ourselves, but rather sacrifice is done because of our love for others. And a reminder of Jesus' first sacrifice was not so that God might be glorified, although God was glorified in the end. But Jesus' first sacrifice came because God loved us. Sacrifice would not have been possible if God would not have loved deeply in his time. So as followers of Jesus in, in these next few weeks of Lent, what do we sacrifice? Well, one of the first and one of the most crucial things that we sacrifice as followers of Jesus is time. Uh, think about your everyday interactions with friends and family, with people out uh, on the roadways and the stores. Yes, yeah, so I know how have you been doing? What's been going on? Number one thing everybody says, oh, I've been so busy. Right? A friend of mine was talking about this phenomenon. He said somebody had been telling him how busy they were. And as they told him how busy they were, he was getting in his mind a long list of items to say that so that he could compete. I said, well, I've been really busy, too. You know, it becomes sort of a one-up in game. Right. Well, I've been doing this. You know, time becomes very valuable to us as modern-day Christians and modern-day Americans. If you don't think this is true, I just ride the metro train and come back during rush hour and notice how everybody gets up out of their seats before the doors open and try to just squeeze your way out with everybody else. Time is important, and time seems to be a limited quantity, right? Even as we face our own mortality and the death of those that we love and the illness of those that we love, time is so precious. Time can seem like it's fleeting, and so we want to hold on to every time that we have. And when new things come in and demand more time from us, and time is so precious, it becomes scary to think of committing to anything else, because we're so busy. And the reality of following Jesus, having a relationship with Jesus, is that just like any other relationship in our lives, our faith 
walk takes time. It takes commitment. It takes getting up in the morning, maybe on Sunday morning, uh, maybe leaving your house as many of you did this Wednesday night in the midst of a blizzard <laughs> and coming to church to try it out. And it's not just for worship. Um, it takes time to be committed as a follower of Jesus, perhaps to service, perhaps to study, perhaps to morning questions. All these things take time. And time for us as Americans and as people of the world today is the method by which we measure our lives. And time seems like of anything the most absolute. We all know how long a second is. We all know how long a minute is. But if you study time and how time is calculated, time, like anything else, is relative. So if we were somehow able to go as fast as the speed of light, then time would stop. I thought that was fascinating the first time I heard it. The time is actually relative to everything else in the world. It is not absolute. A real easy way to illustrate this in the relative nature of time is to look at time zones. If you're to get in a plane this morning and fly across the Atlantic Ocean over to London, you would, in essence, lose five hours of your life because of the way that time works. Time, like everything else, is relative. And because of that relative nature of time, God can do some pretty remarkable things, even in the midst of time and our busy lives. Psalm 90, verse 4, talks about the way that God understands time. It says, For a thousand years in your sight, Lord, are like yesterday, when it is past, or like a watch in the night. You know, we were talking, people talk about the truth of creation in Genesis, how on the first day God did this, and the second day God did this. And when people are talking about uh, the story of Genesis, the story of creation, and putting it in context with evolution, with the ways that the scientific world evolved, they'll say, well, how long really was a day for God? Perhaps a day was 100,000 years for God. Psalm 90 says, a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past. And many of you, uh, as we get older, we understand time differently, of course, right? When you're young, it seems like your birthday takes forever to come. Oh my gosh, I'm seven and a half. I'm going to be eight. It's coming. And then the older you get, those years fly by a little faster, right? Okay. No way. No way I'm going to be 30. Some people talk about their wedding day. And 
midst of that bursting love. Your whole family is there. Your friends are there. The moment of Kairos. Maybe it's a special moment here in the bedside of someone you love in the midst of prayer, holding hands as a family together. The moment of Kairos. Maybe it's visiting someone in the hospital after they've come through a difficult surgery and looking in their eyes and realizing that they didn't have to survive. Kairos time. It can be as simple as sitting at a stoplight, being frustrated with your day, and looking up ahead and seeing the beauty of a sunset up ahead, and reminding, remembering for a moment that there still is beauty in the world. Those are moments of Kairos. They don't just happen, you know, maybe in the moment of holding a newborn baby for the first time. They don't happen just once or twice a life, but God gives us these moments of kairos all the time, nearly every day. God peeks in and shatters our conception of time and gives us moments of kairos, maybe with a dear friend you haven't seen for a while, and in the midst of that conversation, knowing that your love for one another is saying more than words could ever say. Kairos time the gift that God gives us. And it's seen throughout the Bible when Jesus meets with the woman at the well and he talks about time. It's a time. I was meeting with her. It was Kairos time. A holy time when the living water came and filled both of them. When Paul writes about the fullness of time, when the fullness of time has come, this is the phrase that, uses, that Paul uses throughout the New Testament. The fullness of time is not talking about a certain period of years, maybe a thousand years, maybe two thousand years, but the fullness of time is talking about when God's presence on earth is filled. And you can bet that it was Kairos when Jesus rose on Easter morning and the uh, curtain at the temple was split into two. It was Kairos. You know, as I mentioned, as followers of Jesus, we do sacrifice time to follow Jesus. And you can see that in the rush of getting ready for church every Sunday morning. Even as a pastor, it still happens to me. I'm getting ready this morning, trying to hustle up for church. And I thought, hey, we're going to get here really early this morning. And I finally had gotten ready. I looked at my clock. Oh, my gosh, it's already 8.30. <laughs> How did that happen? We were always late as a family coming to church with my mom. And we were very regular church attendees, but we would always be sneaking in in the background. Her dad was a pastor, so I don't know how that got to be the routine. But we do sacrifice time to follow Jesus. And however that looks in your life, whether it's time to read your Bible, time to have a conversation with friends about your faith, time to be involved in the Bible study groups or fellowship groups, time to visit people in the hospital, it does take and yet at the same time, even if we feel that we're losing time to follow Jesus, all this time that we could be using for other things, maybe this morning you could have been cleaning your house, maybe this morning you could have been having breakfast or brunch, maybe this morning you could have been sleeping. It seems like we're sacrificing time, but we're also gaining kairos. The closer we come to Jesus, we realize that time, even as it marches on in monotony, Following Jesus gives us the way to realize those kairos moments in every second of our lives. And so even though it seems as if we're losing time, we're also gaining time in love. The reading here talking about kairos moments. This comes from a blog called Monastery. It's about um, parenthood and growing up, but it also can be translated to all sorts of different times in our lives when we are faced with a burden that seems insurmountable. Maybe it's a moment of caring for a loved one who's come down with an illness. Maybe it's a moment of having just retired and now looking forward to, okay, what, what is next in my life? And so she writes about the difference between Kronos and Kairos. And she says, last week a woman approached me in the Target line and said the following, Sugar, I hope you are enjoying this. I love every single second of parenting my two girls. Every single second. Moment. These days go by fast. At this particular moment, she says her daughter Anna had swiped a bra from the cart and arranged it over her sweater, while sucking on a lollipop undoubtedly found on the ground. She had also shoplifted clip on neon feathers stuck in her hair. She looked exactly like a contestant from Toddlers and Tiaras, a losing contestant. 
The mom says, I couldn't find my son Chase anywhere. And Tish was sucking the pen from the credit card machine while the woman in front of me was trying to use it. <laughs> and so I looked at the woman and smiled and said, thank you. Yes, me too. I am enjoying every single moment, especially this one. Yes, thank you. And she talks about her husband. She said, Craig is a software salesman. It's a hard job in this economy. And he comes home each day and talks a little bit about how hard it is. And I don't ever feel the need to suggest that maybe he's not doing it right, or that he's negative for noticing that it's hard, or maybe that he shouldn't even consider taking on more responsibility. And I doubt that anybody comes by his office to make sure he's enjoying himself. <laughs> I doubt his boss peeks at his office and says, this career stuff, it goes by so fast. Are you enjoying every moment in there, Craig? The fiscal year goes by. Carpe diem. <coughs> I think people, not only um, for parenting or people telling you to seize every single moment, but also for us as Christians in our walk of faith. Maybe people come into the church and expect every single moment is going to be this fabulous moment. We have to carpe diem, seize every moment as followers of Jesus, or whatever it is that's your current challenge of the moment. Not every moment is going to be wonderful and enjoyable, but we do it for those kairos moments as parenting to look at your children and see how, you know, changing all those poopy diapers. Jake uh, took his diaper out yesterday and pooped in his crib. <laughs> but all those moments pay off, right? Or even as, you know, as you're coming into a new point in your life in retirement and figuring out and everyone's saying, oh, retirement must, must be wonderful. What are you doing and in the morning every day? My dad talks about this and he said, you can never feel like you're doing enough or fulfilling enough. This author reminds us we do it for kairos moments. She says there are two different types of time. Chronos time is what we live in. It's regular time. It's one minute at a time. It's staring down the clock till bedtime time or the end of work time or the end of class time. <coughs> it's ten excruciating minutes in the target line time or at that light on uh, Lehigh and Chestnut. Does anyone know what that's that like? Many, many minutes. It's four screaming minutes in time out time. It's two hours till daddy gets home time. Kronos is the hard, slow passing time we often live in. Have you lived in Kronos, maybe waiting for results of an MRI, of a test? And then she says, then there's Kairos time. Kairos is God's time. It's time outside of time. It's metaphysical time. Kairos is the magical moments in which time stands still. I have a few mo those moments every day, and I cherish them, she says. And they leave as fast as they come, maybe in the midst of a brief hug with a spouse they haven't seen all day. Maybe kissing a grandchild. But I mark them, she says. I say the word kairos in my head each time I leave Maybe it's in the midst of singing as we did this morning, a beautiful <coughs> And at the end of the day, I don't remember exactly what my Kairos moments were, but I remember that I had them. And that makes the pain of the daily grind, the daily parenting, taking care of little ones, the daily taking care of a spouse who's going through a rough time, the daily marching out your own new path in the midst of life. If I had a couple of Kairos moments during the day, I'd call it a success. She says, no matter what else happens, if God came and changed my life and stopped my time, even for a moment each day, I'd call it a success. You can't carpe diem every second, she says, but carpe a couple of Kairoses a day for me. That's good enough for me, she says. And for us, that's good enough for God. God calls us to think about the why why Jesus came, why he was resurrected. Even as we give up our time, our freedom, our money, our selfishness, we focus on the who of Jesus, that Jesus surely has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, whatever that is in our lives. Jesus has carried it, and even as we carry our burdens, we are promised not only a couple of, mo of moments of kairos, but everlasting kairos, even in the face of
Jesus reminds us, I appeal to you, therefore, in this Lent, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, the world of chronos, where time is limited, and we all must compete to be busy enough, but rather be transformed by those kairos moments, by the renewing of your mind, by the love of God and of one another. Pray. Lord, we give you thanks for those moments of Kairos, whatever they look like in our lives, where Jesus comes and touches us and changes us and stops the unending march of time even for a moment. We pray that you might continue to touch us and change us throughout this land, that we may grow closer to you and